Welcome to the What is Smart podcast. We dive deep into the ever-evolving world of intelligence, learning, and success. Join us as we engage with leading educators, psychologists, technologists, and thinkers, unraveling insights and challenging old notions. From EQ to creativity, from tech savviness to social awareness, What is Smart is your guide to understanding intelligence in the 21st century. Let's change education together. Hello, everybody, and welcome to What is Smart. I'm Garrett Wilhelm, your host. What is Smart is brought to you by the Gardens Foundation. We are doing the work out there in the trenches, friends, to really change education at the level of the student, the way it looks and feels, and to do that, it costs money. Oh my goodness, I know. Garrett, are you just on here to hit me up for a little cash? The answer is maybe, maybe. I'm going to be honest. I'm always honest. So we do have merch. You can visit the www.thegardensfoundation.org. It'll go right here. Uh, You can go to the website. You can purchase sweatshirts, t-shirts with the What is Smart logo on it. It's a great question to ask. It's a great, great question for people to be thinking about. And that being said, we're out there finding great people across the world to speak to the big question, what is smart? Today is no different. Today, we have Eric Francis, who is an international author and presenter with over 25 years of experience working in education. He's right there with me. As a classroom teacher, check. A site administrator, also check, an education program specialist with the state education agency and a staff development trainer who produces and provides professional development, guidance and support for teachers and school leaders. (laughs) Woo, that's a big, healthy resume there, Eric. Eric, thank you so much for joining us on the What is Smart podcast today. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you for having me today. I'm glad um, you have this forum and I'm really honored to be invited to be speaking on it. Yeah, of course. And and one of the things that I found in doing some research on you from my team that finds you on the internet is you love comic books. And I love comic books as well. Um, grew up on them. Classic story. Had the books. Had, I mean, had boxes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and of course, the reason I say that is we like to start our podcast out with an origin story. And it, it of course, very short, very concise, but Eric, we'd want to know, and our listeners and viewers want to know, how you got into education uh, at first, what inspired you to do so, and then what is your current function in the field of education? Well, it's an interesting origin. Um, It was not my intended career. It was a second career. I actually went into the film industry before I became an educator, Uh, worked in Hollywood Mm -hmm. a couple of years uh, in the early 90s, and um, Let's just say it's really interesting to see a lot of stuff that's coming out now about Hollywood because it's always been there. Now it's just, you know, with social media and cell phones and and cameras everywhere, we now can really expose the underbelly of what it is. Um, It it actually was a very, very hard experience socially, emotionally for me. So one time of the once of the eight times I got fired by the producer I worked for. Um, I met this woman in a bookstore because that's how I used to spend my days in LA is reading books off the shelf. And yeah, I mean, that because that, I couldn't afford it. I mean, I had no money practically. Where, even though I was working for a big name producer on uh, the Warner Brothers and Sony lot, I had no money. So I just read books off the shelf. Kind of, that's how we learned that with comic books. Um, Love it. Talking with her and she asked me if I wanted to come and observe her class in Burbank uh, Unified. And I said, sure. And and I was actually going the route saying, okay, maybe I should start becoming a teacher. I, I've always enjoyed working with kids. I was a camp counselor growing up. Uh, I had, my siblings were 20 years younger than me, actually. So, you know, being kind of that, that uh, adult in their life. So uh, I did that for a few years and I decided to leave. And then I moved out here to Arizona, which is where I live now. And I started my career in education. I started as a middle school and high school teacher. Uh, became a site administrator for a shorter period of time. You know, I had the career path all mapped out. And as <laughs> sometimes, you know, forks in the road or obstructions in the road doesn't go the way you think it's going to go. Um, I didn't like being a site administrator, actually. Um, Hard I was, job. Well, yeah. It, it Well, it, you talk about it being an instructional leader, and I felt like I was anything but. You know, right. my grandfathers who were NYPD officers were proud of me because I became that cop without a badge. So, you know, using your interrogation techniques, trying to figure out who skipped fourth hour. So I worked, 
transportation agency here in Arizona, learned about policy, learned about law, learned a lot about Title I, learned about uh, English language learners from a policy and funding perspective. 2012, someone put a bug in my ear to become a, quote, consultant. Um, and I did that slowly. I didn't just dive in. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was in my head or in my ideas. It was like, what is this? And now it's more like, hey, I can go this route. It's an option. It's a pathway. Kind of like a social media director. Um, then um, started presenting the conference circuit. Got approached to have my first book published. Went with ASCD. And then just really out there presenting professional development. And then the pandemic hit. And I wrote my second book, Deconstructing Depth of Knowledge, based upon DOK. And just proud to say I just published my uh, third book. My second book was Solution Tree. And uh, as I'm talking, I'm working on my fourth book. So, so again, I think the interesting thing about the origin is that it was not, um, it was not something that was a goal like the way it is today. Like you hear a lot of people say, I want to be an education author. I want to be an education consultant. I want to be an education presenter. It was just something like there was this thing and there was a bunch of us who at the time in the 2000s, the late 2000s, early 2010, who kind of created this industry. I'm proud to say I'm kind of one of them. I'd say I'm the second wave, not the first wave, maybe even the third wave. And uh, yeah, and I've just been blessed and fortunate to be doing what I've been doing for the last 12 years. That is awesome and and quite the dedication because in any you know education career, you have dramatic ups and downs. You have more moments that you want to run away from it than you do you want to run towards it. Um, but it's nice to hear that you've kind of dedicated your outside the box thinking at the time, right? Because mm. I can relate to exactly that time frame when everybody's really looking to push education forward and prepare learners. I think it also went alongside the tech industry. And, you know, you're watching some of the game changing people in the world never finish college. And then you start looking around and going, well, okay, now life to our conversation that we had a little bit off air, um, you know, life kind of ends up dictating the need for a new approach very quickly, um, whether we want to or not. And I think we're starting finally to get there. One of the things that I did notice about your work, Eric, is you emphasize the importance of great questions, posing good questions to promote student inquiry. Now, we're always thinking about in our mission, how do we land professional development and teacher education programs that teach that? And as such, is there a framework that you use or teach or practice to develop great questions? Because that is very a very big part of that. It is. And I think we need to give ourselves a little bit of a break and we need to stop putting so much pressure, not only on um, the teachers, but also the students to come up with good questions. It demands not only a lot of critical thinking, but also demands a lot of creative thinking that questioning is not just about analyzing, evaluating. It's it. There's a creating, there's a synthesizing part of it that we really have to focus on. But there's also a social emotional aspect of it because Questioning is uncomfortable and asking questions is uncomfortable. And school has actually created that because if you think about it, what I like <laughs> to say is that as Such teachers- Such a good point. Right. We do three things. We present information, we provide instructions, and we pose questions primarily for the purpose of assessment. And when you ask someone a question, there's a lot of anxiety about it because number one, you need to have an answer. And number one, your answer needs to be correct. And that's a lot of pressure from the response side. There's also a lot of pressure to say, you know, don't ask lower level questions. You need to ask higher level questions, deeper questions. No, you need to ask questions. You need to ask questions that not only stimulate different and deeper levels of thinking, notice I said different and deeper, which means that questions that ask kids to remember and understand, they're good questions. But we shouldn't have to pressure, say, oh, I want them to analyze. I want them to evaluate. I want them to create. We'll get them there, okay? Or you can even start there and then tear it back down and then do that. It's not the question you ask. I like to quote Eric Clapton. It's in the way that you use it. Because if I say to you, what is two plus two, you would say to me, four, obviously. Right. But then I'll go to you and say, what do you mean? Or I'll say, here's my new thing I'm saying lately. 
you're right, but why? Mm. Okay. Now make, make them explain. Yeah, I was gonna say right. that's critical thinking. Or if I say to you, who's the first president of the United States? I would say Vladimir. No, I'm kidding. Uh yeah. George Washington, of course. And I'd say, what do you mean? Well, that's a great question. And I right. see exactly your point. It so, kind and of that's it, where the tech comes in. Because if I enter that question, who's the first president of the United States into mm. Google, the first thing will come up is George Washington, mostly because it's the amount of hits it gets, SEO searches. But then when you guys start scrolling, you're going to start seeing some articles from credible sources that say, who was the real first president of the United States or who's considered to be the first president of the United States. And you learn about someone named John Hansen, who was appointed as president of the United States in Congress assembled under the Articles of Confederation. See, and now that's that deeper learning. I'm not, but now the question isn't who's the first president of the United States. The question becomes what distinguished those presidents from the presidents that were elected under the constitution. And the argumentative question is, should George Washington be considered, uh, continue to be acknowledged as the first president of the United States, or should we also acknowledge the other 10 who were appointed under the Articles of Confederation? Now, some people will say, N you shouldn't acknowledge those other 10. You're right, but why? They have their evidence. Well, you should acknowledge the other 10. You're right, but why? You know, another thing to get people talking and communicating, I'm actually quoting a lot of Billy Joel to say, you may be wrong, but you may be right. And that's the thing. I think more so it's not stressing people out about the question we ask and whether it's a quote, good question. A good question stimulates different and diff deeper levels of thinking. You can use it to check for knowledge, understanding and awareness and confirm it. But it also can expand knowledge and extend thinking. So let me so let me show you an example. How did Edgar Allan Poe create an entire genre of literary fiction? That's a very deep question, and I would say some some of it has to do with drugs. <laughs> now watch how I'm going to deliver this. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to invite you into the conversation with a question. What if I told you he was the first author to write? a short detective mystery story featuring a detective or sleuth using deductive logic and reasoning to solve a crime. Who, does that, ask, who does that yeah, sound like? That sounds like Batman. <laughs> or even like a lot of kids say Sherlock Holmes. Right, right, right. What if I told you that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle actually admitted that he based Sherlock Holmes off a character Edgar Allan Poe created 50, 60 years before named C. Auguste de Pomp. And he was featured in a story called The Murders in the Rue, Murders in the Rue, Murders in the Rue Morgue, uh, which is really funny because you talk about comic books. You probably know of the comic, maybe, maybe you know of the comic, uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Everybody oh, of knows course. The yep. He was actually in the comic. And what they did in the movie, what if I told you what, it, he, what they did was they replaced him with um, Tom Sawyer, his character, because they want to make it more of a familiar character and such. But what if I told you that actually the third story in the Tom, Tom, Tom Sawyer's uh, trilogy is Tom Sawyer Detective, and that's how they were able to do it? It blow my mind and look definitely gets me learned. thinking. That's exactly right. right. Yeah, what you learned right without me teaching you and telling you and lecturing by saying, what if I told you by asking the question? And that's the other thing. You use good questions to pique curiosity, imagination, interest, and wonder. Because now I drew you in. That's also what you're going to remember. A lot of the times our kids, when you ask your kids, what did they do in school today? They'll say, nothing. Or what'd you learn in school today? I don't know. Because you got this objective up on the board that's written in some sort of technical language that it's not sticking with them. And it's also putting words in their mouth with it's a learning target. I can fluently multiply multi-digit numbers using the um, standard algorithm. Okay, great. If I said, how could you fluently multiply multi-digit numbers using a standard algorithm? Now I'm having a conversation with you. Now I'm inviting you into the conversation. Hey, what'd you learn today? Well, our teacher asked us how we could fluently multiply multi-digit numbers using a standard algorithm, see? And that's the other thing about a good question is that it encourages students to express and share their learning in their own unique way. You know, off air, we talk about personalized learning. So 
it's not so much what is the answer and whether it's correct or incorrect. Can you explain it with examples and evidence? Can you express your opinions with examples and evidence? Can you justify it or verify it? Can you explore and extend? That's that smart. I like to say the communication, the expression, and it doesn't have to always be verbal. The expression is really the sign of true smart or intelligence. And, and that's what a good question does. It also prompts the instructional, you know, students to reflect before responding. Like, I didn't expect you to have an answer. I want you to think about it. And it also, you can also have it to basically um, serve as the instructional focus, present the instructional focus. So imagine walking in your classroom, instead of seeing this objective up on the board that teachers feel required to put up there, and a lot of times they don't erase it, for a week um or <laughs> so right to do this bell work <laughs> and often i mean there's times i can't tell you what teachers are like oh man don't do that as the bell work that could run the whole class that question that was a good question that could have run the whole class you know no i got to get them into this activity no you don't the activity is addressing the question That's right? right and imagine walking and this is the way i taught is like they would walk in and they would see the question of the day or they would see their desks lined up in a certain way and I would run my chin and I would say something. I say, so uh, how could you uh, use linear equations to create football plays? What? Okay, now I'm going to bring in Madden football. I'm going to put the X's and O's there and I'm going to go show, because as you know, Madden football, X's and O's. Now I'm going to put a graph over it and I'm going to say your X axis is your offensive line. Your Y axis is your quarterback to the end zone. Now I want you to graph those plays, make a formula for those plays. And what I love about that is that that right there, that pro the next thing that happens after those great questions or that moment of what you mentioned, which is wonder or wow, those mm -hmm. things that captivate us, right? Like I have a fascination with, you know, teaching teachers, especially at the early education, which I'm going to tie into in a second, at the early education level, more training on things like improv than things like delivering of information to be quick on your toes, to be able to scaffold in the way that you're talking about of, you know, way more thinking happening for me in that moment of no way, really? Mm -hmm. That moment mm -hmm. of really even me leaning into that physically shows mm -hmm. me that I'm even more interested. What we're doing in school, unfortunately, and you mentioned this, is training behavior. We're yeah. saying, this and then this, this right. and then this. I say this and then you say this. And then mm -hmm. if you don't say it right, you're going to have to do it again. Right. You know, so I have a whole I have a whole satirical presentation when I say satire. It's really funny. Sometimes it gets me in trouble because people are thinking, oh, you're being sarcastic or <laughs> no, it's satire. It's satire is about changing behavior and using humor to change behavior. So I say how we kill questioning in school and you talked about early childhood. Now, you think about it, but the child between the age of two and five, what's the question they always ask? Why? Okay. And they're not testing us. They're trying to acquire, apply, analyze, and augment their knowledge. We get frustrated. I mean, Louis C.K. does a whole great routine. On I, I love that bit so yeah. much where he's like, I feel stupid at the end of it. He's like, I don't, exactly. know. I don't know why the sun is there. <laughs> so, so the thing is, what I say is that questioning and answering is how adults and children communicate to each other. Okay. When you go to school, two things happen. One is more of a pedagogical where basically... Now you're going to school. Now it's the adult who asks the questions. But there's also a physiological because the child's frontal cortex is is developing, and but that the questions come from the the center, the cerebral cortex there, and what happens is is that it slows down. Like if you put an MRI in front of a child's brain between age two and five, it looks like the Fourth of July. It slows down. That's why a lot of our children in first grade, when you encounter them to say. They say, I have a question. Well, what's your question? I went to McDonald's last night. Okay. That's not the oh. clue. That's what, yeah. yeah. So yeah. They, they, they forget how to question to learn. The other thing is, is that they, that, that during K through two, that's the first time a child learns how not to take risks with questions. Because the first time that if they are incorrect or wrong, 
they will get what I call the Dwayne Johnson, the cock of the eyebrow or the, or the look down the nose. Now I know I cannot afford to be incorrect or wrong, yet we learn from being incorrect, wrong, or from our mistakes. Third grade is where it really dies down because now that's where the testing begins, the state assessment, and we have to be time on task, okay? We don't have time because according to that curriculum map we made at the beginning of the year, we're done with this by this date. And we're and it's like almost like being in a museum and we're moving and we're moving. Fourth and fifth and sixth grade is where you have the social pressure start to come in where the kids, where you ask a question. Like to me, when the teacher said to me, does anyone have any questions? It was show and tell time. I was like, yeah, and I got a lot. You're like, like yeah. <laughs> now Chapter it's got to be on what, and my teacher, so my teacher would even say, does anyone have any questions? My hand would shoot up. On what I'm teaching, Eric. Oh, okay. I mean, I have my report cards over there where my behavior, remember when we used to have notes on a report card or teachers to actually write them out for us, ask too many questions. But I was a questioner. I still am. So you have the social pressure where you start asking questions and kids look at you and go, duh, or you're so stupid, or you're like my buddy growing up who used to say, hey, Eric, keep asking questions. We're wasting time in class. Right. Middle school. It becomes, and again, this is a generalization, but it's a satire change behavior because unfortunately I don't want people to walk away saying they hear one thing, but they're not looking at the meaning behind it. Middle school, it becomes a battle of wills because now, now I'm not questioning you. Now I'm not question, have a question. I'm questioning you. Are you right? How do you know that you're right? Well, wait a minute. What about this? Okay. Or I'll find something on the internet and I'll bring it in and completely disrupt the class. Hey, did you know that? Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Now it becomes more so about keeping it, you know, don't, don't go off task, keep it in line. Are you questioning me? I'm going to send you to the office. By the time the kids get to high school where we really want them questioning, it's been killed. They've learned their lesson. I'm good. Four years in and out. You know, I tried to ask questions in third grade. My teacher said time on task. Fourth and fifth grade, my kids call my friends call me done. You're so stupid. Sixth, seventh, eighth grade, I got sent to the office or I was accused of basically trying to disrupt class like that. I'm good. Just tell me what I need to know to get my grad my my degree. And that's how we kill questioning in school. And what we need to do is we need to create a comfort zone, a risk-free comfort zone that basically allows students not only to ask questions, but to be able to address the questions and be okay if you're correct or incorrect, which is irrefutable, but right and wrong is a matter of perspective. And, and that is a big thing with how we need to look at our responses is that even with, with adults, like we know a lot of stuff. So, and we encounter that in professional development. Oh, so you're telling me that I've been doing it wrong. No, I'm telling you that you've been doing it right based upon what you've been taught and told. But there's That's new right. information and changing circumstances and conditions. I'm going to ask you to rethink in light of this. You need to decide whether you're going to reconsider. That's how you work with adults. That's how you get them to change. Because if I said to you, hey, Garrett, you need change. What are you going to say? I would be uninformed, pessimistic. <laughs> right. Two responses, no one why. That's okay? right. But if I say, hey, here's new data information. There's the chance. Of, let's, let's reflect on the circumstance and conditions and how they changed. You may be right. You may be wrong. You may be wrong. You may be right. Um, or you're right. But are you still right? And that's the big, that's how you do it with adults. And it's actually even working with kids. It's actually a very social emotional thing where I'm actually saying, you're right, but why? Or if they're incorrect, okay, you may be wrong. And I would I would argue that, you know, just in you developing, you know, professional development programs and programming regarding this, you know, thinking about how to constantly be open, because that is the biggest challenge when it comes to innovation implemented at on the ground with educators, is you think about, 60 year old Ethel still teaching in a classroom, barely got used to an iPad and you're giving her all this new tool or framework. It's an immediate no-go, I taught this way. So having the ability through embodying that experience yourself, meaning here's this Ethel, right? And you come to her with these kind of, th this framework of here's the information, consider it. And does that change your line of thinking? It, it allows her to feel 
how it feels to make a more informed decision. And, and I would argue, learn more. You know, when when someone is so closed off as such, which is by someone, I mean, the majority of educators in the field right now, you know, having the in or the tool to get in is so valuable and important. And I see that tool that you're using in even just how you frame questions and conversations being so fundamentally uh, game changing for professional development in general, because we need teachers to embody what we're talking about. Right. But Ethel needs to choose <clears throat> or that that teacher. And it's not just someone who's 60. I mean, I've seen so. So have you ever heard of the theory of diffusion and innovation, Everett Rogers? It sounds very familiar. I, we know the terminology. We don't know the why behind. That's what I always do is like, what's the why behind this? I know what. It, OK, so you know how you hear early adopters, early majority, late majority, laggards, innovators. It's actually a social change model. And I and I looked it up because here's the question I was asking. I was facing a lot of roadblocks this year with professional development. I had a lot of teachers who were just like, I'm just done. It's kind of like the kids. I've been tested out. I've been trained out. I'm, I'm done. Just let me do my job. Okay. But what do we need to do to make that change happen? That's where I got the whole rethinking. You may be right, but are you still right? That's Adam Grant's work. Um, find your why, start your why, that's Simon Sinek. I did that to make myself better. And that's something with questioning as well. But instead of having that six-year, because you can have that six-year-old teacher who's like, wow, the, the innovator, they're going to the ISTE conference, they're going to FETC, and that age is just a number. The problem is more so, who? why are you who you are? So you need to figure out, how do I get that person to choose to want to go on this journey. And that's the thing about professional development because we have these things where it's a full day training, everybody's in there from the kindergarten to the 12th grade teacher, and they're all in the same training. And I got science teachers and math teachers and English teachers and 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 social studies teachers and PE teachers there, and we're all there. You talk about differentiating instruction. That's why, I, to be honest, I don't really have much empathy when someone says to me, how am I supposed to differentiate instruction for 40 kids? I say, try with 120 adults and right. at least coming back tomorrow, you know? So how do we get through to them? And that's that questioning. That's that inquiry. The The innovators, they're just going to take it. They're, they're like, you know, these are the people who sleep out for Apple iPhones, even though we can get them three weeks later. They're the ones who, yep, they, they sleep out for that first Star Wars showing. I could watch it later in the day. I can even go watch it later in the week, but nope. Tickets are now on sale. I got to get the tickets. I got to get there. I got to be first in line. I got to make sure the sounds, you know, where I am. Okay, that's the innovators. The early adopters, and this is all Everett Rogers theory, the early adopters are the ones who are wanting to make the change and willing to make the change. And they're what um, would be considered the connectors, the champions, and the mavens. And that basically, they're the one, those two are going to lead it. But you got to be careful because the innovators can scare people off. I mean, right. you know, you're a tech person. You're an innovator. You know, you talk tech with somebody. People are like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm still trying to figure out how to turn on the computer. You know, that's and that's been to be to speak to your point. That's been my experience at times. Right. But that's 20 to 25 percent of your population. And then there's a chasm that you got across. And then you got what's called early majority and late majority. That's 68% of your population, 34% early majority, 34% late majority. Your early majority goes, I'm not too sure about this. Your late majority says, well, let me see how it works for other people. Or I guess resistance is futile, to quote, quote the Borg. Your laggards are not going nice. to, okay? They're not. They're just not. And we all had this thing to go, we got to get the laggards on board. No, you don't. They have to choose to get on board. So that's why I say with the with with the conversations, you need to say, or you should say, I'm going to say you need, you should. I make suggestions, you make decisions. That's a Peloton instructor's quote. Um, look, this is the direction we're going. We understand this is uncomfortable for you, but this is the direction we're going, okay? Now, here's the thing. We will help and support you every which way with this innovation or with this new direction. Okay, we'll give you all the supports. We get it. You're uncomfortable. Or you can choose not to do it. And that's okay. 
This may not be the place for you anymore. That's a fear from two standpoints. From a leadership standpoint, how am I going to get a body to replace that employee? Okay. And now I've been doing this for 30, 40 years. Are you telling me I need to go elsewhere? Okay. You're giving them that choice. So here, we're going to help you. Or you don't want to go on this track. You don't want to do this. That's fine. But here's what you can't do. Number one, you can't dig your heels into the ground and say, I'm not doing it. And number two, you can't speak out against it. Okay, because now we're going to have another conversation. All right. That's the way we need to handle. Now, look at how I did that. Some people just listen to that and say, that sounds cruel. No, it's not. That's human nature. Hey, this is where the company's going. I understand you don't like digital. We're not doing cell cellulite film anymore. We're going this way. Okay. Now, you can come with us, you can bring your tills of silence, or you say, hey, you know what? I don't want to do this. I'm going to find a company that does this. But you can't just sit there and dig your heels, and you can't just sit there and, and resist it and disrupt it. Those are the hard conversations, because that is how your organization is going to move forward. You need to question who, not who needs it, but who needs to lead it. And what I love, I would fully agree with you, and I would argue, too, that 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 is one of the big stop gaps in the innovation on the student level in schools is that, you know, we have a ton of empathy for those that still choose not to go the innovative route or the let's not even use innovative, let's use research backed route, right? Yes. Those that right. those that refuse to do that, well, now you're refusing something much larger to your point you're not just refusing me and your ego you're refusing a research-backed tool that will improve the lives of students so having empathy is important with your educators but empathy with boundaries which i think is what we're talking about and mm -hmm. making those boundaries very clear coupled with co-creation right i think what's really important that you mentioned there is inviting that teacher in just like we would invite a student in right to to be a part of this experience together like right. okay i hear that you're having a tough time with this let's talk about how we can support you in delivering this let's talk about you know rather than the the typical fashion of do this right the fear-based no. leadership it's right? funny you say because what i do is i do this thing actually in climate thing where i show the engines of a mustang from 1960s to the 2020 model, okay? And I mean, I've done this for you, and I say, this is a Ford Mustang engine. They see how it changed. And I said, okay, when did you run, roll off the assembly line? Like I, I'm a 1970s model, you're probably a 1970s model too, okay? The 1990s engine changed much like the way the world changed with the knowledge we went from the industrial revolution mm -hmm. to industrial age to the knowledge and information age and things became digitized the mechanics who basically worked on those cars had to get a new set of skills that doesn't mean their old skills are irrelevant they're a new set of skills okay now when you look at the engine the engine keeps on advancing what does the mechanic need to do they keep on need to learn how to do that okay I then would show them the 2023, 2024 post pandemic model. And you're looking at going, whoa, you know, and now we got AI in cars. Now we got Tesla's. Now we got all these impossible projects now becoming possible. That mechanic needs to have the training. I was working with a school and the teacher who was, um, she was, you know, traditional, what's called politely traditionalist in her, in her attitudes and, and her beliefs. Um, she didn't want to do it. And she said, I prefer the old cars. I prefer to work on the old cars. Mm. And I totally understand. Move what to talking. Cuba? No, right. <laughs> now, but I said, hard, clear to understand, you know, totally understand you. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of those cars on the road and they're not in production. And the principal said, and that's not what's coming in this garage, you know? So mm. if you want to do that, if you want, and hey, that's why people get entrepreneurial and open up their own garage or their own change that garage to charter school. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. or change that to private or change that to homeschool or change that to micro school. That's that innovation. We live in a time where basically we can question why it's not working or whether it's not working for me and do something that makes it work for me. The problem is, is that you always have to consider your audience. And that's sometimes with professional development. It's not about the teachers. It's about the kids. It's about what am I doing to make the kids better? How am I improving myself to make the kids better? That's when I say, is it working in your class? Yes. 80% or more? Well, no. Okay. Why not? Well, you can't reach everybody. Well, you got that attitude. It's like, why are you even playing the game? Well, we, we're not, we can't get to the Super Bowl. Okay. Well, yeah. we can't win the World Series. Then why do you even have a team? Why are you playing the game? It's this is not journey. Some will win, some will lose, some will sing the blues. Okay. And and that's not how it works. Is that we need to figure out, and that's something as a PD person. My biggest lack of success as a PD person is when I can't reach or teach the teacher that I'm working with. Unfortunately, a lot of times in that two to six hour window that they give me for professional development. That's why I put the pressure and even stress on myself, but it's productive struggle and creative frustration to figure out what do I need to do to get through to that teacher? That's why when you see my books, it's a snapshot. But to quote John Hattie, your paraphrase, everything works, but everything works for everybody. What do I need to do? What do I, because if they're not getting it, that's not them. That's me. Amen. I say that all the time. If you, it, it, And that applies to early learning, which mm -hmm. is if you get I, I think about it as stand up comedy. Right. If you get up in front of uh, a group of people and you bomb, it's not mm -hmm. the people. No. Right. Go home getting, and look no. in the mirror. You're not right. funny. Right. So right. then look in the mirror, figure out how you can change. Drop the ego. We use a motto at our schools. Drop the ego. Trust the child. Like mm -hmm. the kid wow. knows. Yeah. Um, and it works. That, man. I'm trying. Uh, no, but uh, and, can, and can I, I mean I, it. can I use that and quote you? I'll make of sure. Course. That, yeah, because of that's the thing. It's total. And you know what's really great? I always talk about, I wish I could do this in my PD. When We Are the World was recorded, Quincy Jones put out a box that said, check your ego at the door. Okay? I wish I could do that sometimes with PD. Check your ego at the door. You know, or it, it, I didn't want to- Because why are we here, right? right? Like, that's my question. And I know that's your question is, are we here to look at ourselves and hear ourselves talk? If so, get out of this industry. Because I wouldn't say that for- a retail salesman selling clothes in a, that doesn't really want to be there because mm -hmm. the responsibility isn't to the knowledge, the intrinsic motivation of a child, but our job is, right? So, so I, yeah. So may I share with you what I'm actually having talked with leaders with about when it comes to professional development? Sure. I'm actually having them say, are we in agreement that we're committed to this? Yes. Are we in agreement that the kids need this? Yes. Okay. What if the teachers don't want it? What do you mean that they don't want it? What if the teachers don't want it? Well, they should want it. Absolutely. I'm paraphrasing actual conversation I have with a lot of people. And they, I said, they, this is good stuff, but what if they don't want it? Well, why? Well, I don't get it. How, this is why when they want, so compare it to this. What do you need to do to be healthy? You need to eat right. You need to work out healthy decisions, not smoke, not drink, not do drugs. What if you don't want to? Okay. That's the thing. Then you get the conversation you and I probably encounter is, well, we need you to sell it to them. No, we're not salespeople. We are sharing it. So what I'm recommending a lot with schools and their leaders is I want you to pick the people who can lead it and want to lead it. Now, there's a difference between people who can do it and learn it quickly and people who want to do it and are willing to do it. You know, I, I mean, I learned that as an AP English language teacher where the kids for grades K through 10, where they've gotten away with their their brilliance or their smart to be able to answer the questions to the expectation. Now they get to AP English language. Now it's not about, can you explain to me who the characters are, why they're the main character and what the theme is? Now it's like, why did they write it that way? What effect does that have on the reader? That's a whole different thing. And they don't understand why they're frustrated with it. And it's just like, they may not be, number one, have that deepness. I need to figure out how to bring that deepness out of them. Or number two, they just don't care. Okay. Right. So when you have a PD, 
and this is actually what I'm talking to a lot of teachers, a lot of schools is like, and, I'm, and you're getting this right now because it's time you were everyone's scheduling where I say, well, what do you want? And they go, you know, we want you to come in one day and train everyone on DOK and questioning, depth of knowledge and questioning, sometimes both. And I'm like, okay, I will do what you need me to do, but I'm going to give make a suggestion. Number one, don't do that to your teachers. And number two, don't do that to me. Right. And they go, what do you mean? Don't do that to my teachers. I said, so you are expecting your teachers to be introduced to a concept, understand the concept, practice the concept and master the concept in the two or six hours you've given me. And implement it. You know, and I'm sure there's it. expectations there. Right. Yeah. And they're learning from a teacher that they're probably never, ever going to see again. Okay. Would you do that to kids? No. Okay, good. Now, from my standpoint, you have given me two to six hours and I want to give you my best. But man, what if I can't within that six because I don't know where your teachers are? That's why when teachers, when people say to me, well, can you give me the agenda for the day? I said, no, I can give you the outcomes for the day. I don't know if I'm going to hit all of them. That depends upon your team. And that's the thing is that you got to know your audience. Okay. But this is what we're going to do. This is essential to learn. This is important to understand. This is nice to know. That's how I'm trying to get out of the one and done, which does not work. And that's the critical questions we need to ask is that why do we keep on doing the one and done? Well, our teachers need it. No, the kids need it. Your teacher should want it. Okay. Because in that teacher's mind, they probably don't want it. And, they, and if they don't want it, they don't feel like they need it. And I am not there to sell you because here's the thing. If I come in and say, DOK starts with the standards. Questioning starts with the standards. And I got teachers who tell me, I really don't look at the standards or I don't use the standards. I'm not assessed or, or those standards are too abstract for me. Okay, now I'm not the trainer anymore. Now I'm the leader saying the only way this is going to be effective is that we start with the standard. I have to basically now get creative with it to say, okay, how do I get this where I can get your buy-in on it? That's not being a trainer. And that's, that's being a leader. I have no teeth. Okay, that's why... The innovation you talk about, the implementation, it needs to come from the leadership. You need to create the leadership to implement it. We need to be Jerry Maguire, help me help you. They are Rod Tidwell on the field. It's kind of funny because my company is called Maverick Education because I'm a Tom Cruise fan with a K. Love it. But I'm thinking I should change to Maguire because lately it's like, I don't want them to know who that Eric Francis is the person coming in because there could be some resentment with that. I want to see them. Take it, do something with it, do something dynamically different and divergent with it, do something that may, and basically then they say, wow, this is mine now. And you know what? I'm going to go write a book about it, which is what that's all. Exactly. I mean, I tell even my leaders in my business and the schools is it is a value add to me. If you go off and start your own thing, I mm -hmm. could not be more proud. If you become my competitor, amazing that's right. amazing because it means right. i did my job right in empowering an educator a leadership uh in education to inform true learning down on the ground right like so that scaffolding is just so important and we, we unfortunately because we could make this podcast three hours the way we're aligning here and i think we should definitely have you back um i have to ask you this question eric you know one of the things that we're we talk a lot about is kind of redefining what that future learner will need in 20 years to be successful in the age of AI, where we'll start to ask what is work, you know, what is life going to look like? Uh, you, you mentioned a little bit already about what you think smart is, but Eric, what do you think smart is? I really think that smart is individualized and personalized. I really think we are all smart in our own unique way. A um, little bit about my my background. My my father was a double amputee and uh, worked a lot with the uh, leading the Amer uh, the American Civil Rights Movement for Disabled. I also have a brother who has special needs. Was born with the umbilical cord strangled around his neck, cut off the oxygen. Um, he's mm. uh, over fifty. Um, he is uh, you know said, basically we call it special needs. He's basically um, profound severely and basically what it is is that um, he can't read and he can't write and he's never going to work with, but, but there's an intelligence. There's a memory. He has a memory like an elephant. You know, he can bring up stuff that I did when I was eight years old. 
All right. He mm -hmm. can bring up something he did. He could ask me, remember my friends growing up in high school. The other amazing thing is, again, like I said, he can't read, but he understands environmental print. Okay. He takes off the covers of his, he still does CDs, DVDs, Blu rays. Okay. He doesn't do streaming, but he knows which CD is what. He know, and there's not pictures on it. OK, it's environmental print. It's a logo graphic of something. It's the patterning and recognition of that patterning. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Why is it that most of our kids who struggle in school and we often cast off out of the AP classes, the IB classes, they go into classes for, you know, shop or the CTE, they're doing more STEM than that kid who took AP, chemistry, anatomy, biology, physics. They're doing more STEM and they're so successful at it. Why are these kids, they're becoming these electricians? And why they, it's not that they're, you know, they're, they're cause it's hands-on training. They have to read these manuals oh, and those yeah. manuals. So why, so when I say smart, smart is individualized and personalized. It relates a lot to what I call and then this is based on the work of Joe Renzulli, gifted, talented, and gifted and talented, and that everybody has a gift, okay? Your talent is how whether you can express your, your divergent thinking, because that's what I look as gifted. Gifted is divergent thinking. And so I have this definition I came up with. I say gifted is, it's how you see the world. Talented is you can do things better than anybody else. Gifted and talented is I see the world in this way. I think this way, and I have a talent to express it. So let's talk about filmmakers really quick. Steven Spielberg's gifted and talented. If you watch the Fablemans, that is the perfect thing. Cause it's not that he can, he's a filmmaker. That's his talent. His gift is how does he see the world? And he uses his talent to do that. Francis Ford Coppola is talented. He's a great filmmaker. It's not a gift. It's a talent. But that's, and he can take The Godfather by Mario Puzo, turn into a film. That's a talent. Take S.E. Hinton's The Outsiders, turn into a film. That's a talent. Bram Stoker's Dracula, turn into a film. Take Heart of Darkness and turn it into a film. That's a talent. George Lucas is gifted. He has a unique vision. He needs other people to have his vision. If you ever read the original drafts of the Star Wars, it's different than what came out. Now, as he got more power, he was able to, because the Ewoks were actually supposed to be in the first Star Wars, but they were Wookiees and no one could understand it. And they said, this sounds too much like Planet of the Apes, because that was the big movie that came out. The reason why people have a hard time with the with episode one through three is that they couldn't connect it. Like Jar Jar Binks, why does everyone hate Jar Jar Binks? Because they can't connect. But George Lucas will say, children understand Jar Jar Binks. And who likes Jar Jar Binks? Kids, okay? Right. The romance between Padme and Anakin felt off, okay? more and, and basically, he didn't have someone who say, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. And that's sometimes what happened. Steve Jobs the same way. He needed Steve Wozniak, yeah. okay? And like I, I like to say, you know, it's funny because you have sometimes these schools, like we want to, I, I work with a school, <laughs> the board member says to me once, we want to be the school for the gifted and talented. And I said, okay, are we becoming the X-Men? What's going on here? And he, I go, why? He goes, because our grades will go up and we won't have behavior issues. And mm. I laughed at him and he was insulted, unfortunately. I said, you have no idea what the difference is between gifted and talented. And he goes, well, what do you mean what gifted and talented is? I said, okay, so let me put it this way. Do you know who Steve Jobs is? He goes, of course. I go, do you know who Charles Manson is? And he goes, What's your point? He started getting a little. I said, fortunately, Steve Jobs had somebody say, that's not what the Beatles meant. And he created Apple. Charles Manson, unfortunately, didn't. And he caused Helter Skelter. So that's the thing. We are all inherently smart because, it, you know, or inherently intelligent. How we become smart is how we hone that intelligence into a talent a technique how can we all can think okay that's what makes us human we all can rationalize that's what makes us humans even from from the most gifted to the most profoundly special needs 
you know, kids with autism, they can think, how can we get them to express their intelligence? That's what makes them smart. I would fully agree. And we can clip all of that. And Will, I think you're so right. It's the application from what I'm hearing, which I think is so spot on. It's not just the gift, the talent, or the gifted and talented. It's the application of that. And, and it's also your uniqueness. What makes you I smart? was just going to say the yeah. iteration of that, right? right? The the innovation, if you will, of that uh, in right. life. So anyway, long story short, Eric, thank you so much for taking uh, time today to talk to our audience. We're all super fascinated with this big question. Your perspective provides such insight when it comes to you know, deeper learning and, you know, the industry terms stickier learning. We want kids to be prepared for the future, not for the past. We don't need them to be houses of information. We need them to be, uh, you know, at being curious and being inquisitive. And and that's where innovation happens. That's where we move forward together. And so. that's where DOK comes because DOK, depth of knowledge, it was not meant to be an instructional model. But what I say about it, the four levels, the level one is I take it in. The level two is I talk about it. The level three is I take it into consideration. And the level four is I transfer it, which is interesting because DOK is often aligned with the Bloom's cognitive framework, which is not accurate. It should be superimposed. The questions I'm having these days is, what if we aligned it with the wrong Bloom's taxonomy? What if it should be more of the effective domain, which is when it comes to learning, how do I receive it, take it in? How do I respond to it? talk about it, how do I value and organize it, take it in consideration, and how do I transfer it to characterize it? So mm. that yeah, be and those are episode. No, I was just gonna say, and that's very different. And I think that should be another episode, but um, you know, mentioning the work that you're doing, where's the best place our viewers and listeners can find your work right now? Right now, if you go to Maverick, M-A-V-E-R-I-K, no C in Maverick, I'm not Tom Cruise. It's my name, my daughter's name, Madison, Avery, and Amanda. Yes, I am a Tom Cruise fan, so that's where it comes from. So M-A-V-E-R-I-K, education.com. You can find me on Twitter, Maverick, M-A-V-E-R-I-K, E-D-U-1-2. Um, and email me, Eric, awesome. Eric a, at Maverick, M-A-V-E-R-I-K, education.com. I do have a thing on my website where you say you want to schedule a meeting and talk. I also have a chat bot there if you want to talk to me. I mean, it'll come right here on my phone. That's probably why I've been looking at my phone a lot because people are always going, I have a question. Can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And that's the thing is that how, you know, that Jerry Maguire, help me help you. That's the That's right. Thing. That's right. And thank you again, Eric. We really appreciate it. We look forward to another conversation, which I know is going to happen. We're going to be having summit soon where we pull together all kinds of amazing minds in the same room to wow. start uh, having these bigger conversations. And I'm excited to include you in that. So from the What is Smart podcast and the Gardens Foundation, we thank everyone for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day and bye-bye.